Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let us honor the uh, distinguished speakers. I know it took a long time, but let's give them another round of applause. It is my distinct pleasure and honor in welcoming all of you to the newly built Park One facility located here in Yoido. The political and financial center of Seoul for this very significant forum examining the vision for a free and unified Korea. Let us give special thanks to the distinguished leaders and policy experts who are contributing to these very important deliberations in person and through the virtual forum. Let's give them all a round of applause. In a few days, we will again commemorate the end of World War II in the Pacific, and with it, Korea's liberation from Japanese colonial rule. It was a moment of great hope for the Korean people, who believed that they would finally be able to realize their historic aspiration of creating a model nation that was independent, united, and free. Tragically, however, that did not happen. The dreams of our ancestors rooted in the founding providential mandate of Hong Yi Gan to live for the greater benefit of all mankind that inspired the independence movement's goal of creating a new Western-style model nation that was independent and free were not to be realized at that time. Instead, Korea became artificially divided along the ideolo ideological lines of the Cold War and has remained so far for the last 77 years in that unnatural state. As a result, that unfulfilled dream of our ancestors casts a shadow over our celebrations. The collective destiny of both Koreas remain still to be achieved. It is even more urgent today, given the current volatile and threatening geopolitical circumstances in Europe, and especially in this region. Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine, and China's assertion of its right to take control of Taiwan, by force if necessary, remind us that the Cold War is not completely behind us. These confrontations stem at root from conflicting worldviews. It is important to note that although Russia and China have adopted elements of the free market economy, both nations uplift the power of the state above all else with little regards to the rights of their own citizens and even the rights of their neighbors. Unlike all Western democracies, that were shaped by or that had adopted the Judeo-Christian ethos that emphasized the sanctity of human life, created in the image of God. Russia still maintains the political philosophy and aspirations of the Soviet past, couched in a new Russian nationalism, while China never abandoned the Maoist revolution or changed its one party communist rule. They disregard the universally accepted truth of all Western democracies, immortalized in the United States Declaration of Independence, that all human beings are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, among which is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Most importantly, they fail to recognize that the main purpose of government or the state is to ensure that those rights and freedoms are protected and maintained for their citizens. In doing so, they reject a core principle expressed in that declaration, that our essential rights and freedoms come from the transcendent creator or God, and that no human institution or government can deny or abrogate them. With the current geopolitical threat of status regimes 
as well as the rise of secular Marxist ideals in woke popular culture. Democratic nations are struggling to secure the fundamental rights and freedoms of their citizens in addition to maintaining their fragile institutions. The sanctity of human life that comes from the Creator, which has once been the bedrock of most Western democracies, is now being challenged at home and abroad. These disturbing trends makes it even more important than ever for democracies to identify and acknowledge where true freedom and rights arise. It should be self-evident that without recognizing a transcendent source for these ideals, imperfect human beings and the institutions they create would inevitably abridge them for the sake of a greater collective purpose rooted in the almighty state. The founders of the United States and the authors of the Declaration clearly understood the limitations of humanity and its, and its institutions. They made it a point to counter the prevalent belief of the 18th century in the divine right of kings with the principle that unalienable rights and freedoms of all people come from the Creator. In essence, the founders countered human claims to ultimate authority without of God. This truth that fundamental freedoms and rights come from the sovereignty of God has endured the test of time and has allowed Western democracies to thrive. Without the acknowledgement of God's sovereignty as a source of fundamental rights and freedoms, serious problems arise. A good example is the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights that does not recognize the Creator as a source of those rights due to its creation during the height of the Cold War. Consequently, the United Nations cannot deal effectively with authoritarian and status regimes that decide for themselves what rights and freedoms their subjects are allowed and what they are not allowed. The two Koreas represent the most extreme example of this confrontation between the democratic South and the status dictatorship in the North. The DPRK is a nuclear armed state whose leadership has sacrificed the well-being of its people to achieve that status. There is no doubt that they would use force to unite the peninsula, for they were the instigators of the Korean War in 1950. That technically still has not ended. Here, as well as on other fronts, geopolitical uncertainty has intensified, increasing the danger that a false step or miscalculation could lead to a major escalation and catastrophe. This is certainly true for North Korea, where the geopolitical situation is exacerbated by internal tensions. The regime has long sacrificed development for its idea of security, foisting extreme hardship and deprivation upon its people. As a result, there is a real danger of food shortages producing famine on a scale rival to the catastrophe of the mid-1990s. People in the DPRK today no longer live in a cocoon, however, with no information from the outside world. The current generation of North Koreans has experienced the freedom of, of enterprise and choice, however restricted, offered by the Changmadong informal markets. They watch TV dramas from China and South Korea and do not accept the propaganda that, however harsh their lives might be, those of their southern brother are even worse. The regime fears the confluence of a more informed, less unconditionally loyal population with greater hardships. This is something that all of us need to be aware of, especially in the last several years. 
when there was the potential of conflict between the DPRK and the United States. Who did the North Korean regime fear more in terms of a threat to them? Was it the United States threat of potential military conflict? Or was it an uprising amongst the North Korean people? The situation is very different from 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago. This is something that we have to keep in mind. Its reaction is typical of authoritarian regimes under pressure, enforcing tighter security at the border with China and cracking down on those accessing foreign media. When loyalty is replaced by fear and the general population suffers increasing hardship, the situation becomes unsustainable. Change is bound to come. We just don't know when or in what form it will happen. The Korean people today face two major challenges, unifying their divided homeland and rediscovering their Korean identity. The two are intertwined. Once we understand that unification is not just about the dealings of governments, but is the coming together of a separated people, then it becomes clear that a strong sense of Korean national identity for both Koreas is essential for the Korean people in the South and in the North to be able to reunite. That identity has been eroded in the North through 77 years of oppression and hardship, but it is also disappearing here in the South. After the devastation of the Korean War, a total national effort was invested into developing the economy and securing the country against another invasion. That produced remarkable prosperity, but we now see that it came at a significant cost. The Chebor system that originally drove growth has become a drag on fresh new entrepreneurial organizations and companies. Highly educated young people suffer debilitating unemployment and many can no longer even afford to get married. To navigate this uncertain future, a clear national purpose is essential, but has been tremendously lacking. To move beyond the stagnant, stagnant status quo, a new approach is needed with a broad vision and a movement to advance it. That vision, I believe, is the Korean dream. As I explain in my book of that title, to build our future, we need to learn from our past. Before the tragic 20th century, before the ideological conflict between communism and democracy, and the bloody division it produced, Koreans shared a 5,000 year history as one homogeneous people with a common culture. That culture was rooted in ideals and principles that arose from the sp founding spirit of Tangun. Foremost among the, these were the ideals of Hongingan, living for the greater benefit of all mankind. From that very beginning of our history, the Korean people held to the moral vision that embraced all people. This was their providential mandate, and to fulfill it was their destiny. Throughout their history, Koreans have embraced different faith traditions that have come to this land but our ancestors always digested those traditions and gave them a unique Korean character rooted in the Hongingan tradition. They recognized Hananim, one Lord or God above, whatever the variety of their religious expression. The Korean flag itself, the Taeguki, is a lesson in the principle that sustained the harmony of the universe. It is an example of the spiritual character inherent in the Korean people across their history. This is the shared heritage of all Koreans, North and South, that transcends the current ideological, political, and national divisions. It is the route to which Koreans in both North and South must be reconnected to provide the vision and energy that can reunify a separated 
people. One of the clear distinctions of the GPF approach rooted in the Korean dream is the recognition of our shared history that has never been one of the components in the unification dialogue. And I cannot emphasize this enough. Arising from this history, the Korean dream promise is for a free and unified Korea, a new nation in which the fundamental God-given rights of all people will be secured under the sovereignty of God. This resonates with the ideals of the 1919 Samuel independence movement. Certainly, they wanted to end Japanese colonial rule. But more than that, they sought to create a nation that lived up to the highest ideals. They even envisioned a free Korea working together with Japan for the benefit of the region and the world. Here was the spirit of Hongingan in action and the aspirations of the nation united around it. The end of World War II brought the end to Japanese colonial rule that we celebrate in August 15th, just two days from now. It also brought the opportunity to create a free and unified Korea, the Samuel independence movement had longed for. UN mandated elections were to be held in 1948 across the whole country, but they never happened. Despite visits by Korean leaders from the South to persuade Kim Il-sung to work with them for a united Korea. He and his Soviet sponsors at that time declined to hold elections in the North. They were held only in the South and shortly thereafter, two separate states were founded, a division that lasts till this day. The aspirations of the Samuel independence movement remained unfulfilled. The separation of the Korean people has persisted far too long. The current status quo cannot endure. The situation on the peninsula is the final remnant of the Cold War and a dark legacy of former colonialism. It is long past time to unify the peninsula and the Korean dream is the way forward to forge a new and better future. The Korean dream can inspire and motivate Koreans in both South and the North to reconnect with their unique identity and heritage in order to take ownership over our common future. At the same time, it offers North Korea the prospect of becoming part of a united and independent nation that enjoys great prosperity as well as fundamental freedoms and rights. Most importantly, it will safeguard the Korean homeland from an increasingly aggressive and powerful China and Russia. Over the next three years, we will work to greatly expand the understanding and support for the Korean dream paradigm, both within Korea and internationally. This initiative already has significant momentum through Action for Korea United, an unprecedented coalition of nearly 1,000 civil society organizations working collaboratively to promote a free and unified Korea. Its education programs have been informing Korean professionals, organizations, opinion leaders, and civil society stakeholders across the social spectrum. The progress of its work will continue to accelerate in the coming years as it builds consensus around unification and the character of the new Korea that will emerge from it. We will build broad support in South Korea and the diaspora around a national vision for peaceful unification based upon the Korean dream. 
By 2025, the 80th anniversary of liberation, we will hold public rallies in towns and cities all over the South in support of a free and unified Korea, reminiscent of the Samil movement for independence more than 100 years ago. The Korean dream will galvanize the hearts of every Korean to realize our collective destiny and thus honor the legacy of our ancestors through seeing the hopes of our forefathers fulfilled. Such a powerful expression of solidarity behind a common vision led by the Korean people themselves instead of any government or political party will allow the South to bypass its hyper-partisan divide and let their brethren in the North know, know that they are not alone. And that, and that we as the Korean people can make what the world deems to be impossible a reality. Amen? This is also a very, another di distinction between the Korean dream paradigm and every other effort for unification. It's a bottom-up approach. This will be the expression of a truly bottom-up movement of the people beyond national and ideological divisions and thereby be a catalyst for a greater international recognition and support. I call upon every Korean everywhere, young and old, at home and abroad, to take ownership over the Korean dream and help this movement come to fruition. <laughs> and for our foreign dignitary and friends, this is not just a call for Koreans, but all of you who believe in freedom and fundamental human rights and the need for a divided people to come together as one. The Korean dream is your dream, is your cause. Becoming the providential instruments in creating a new model nation from the ashes of a divided peninsula that guarantees freedom and human rights in the most consequential region in the world where status powers are on the rise is something that you can stop by owning the Korean dream. Amen? In short, Korean unification will be the most monumental achievement for world peace and will spark the light of hope and possibility for the 21st century. In closing, let me remind you of, a prophetic, of the prophetic words of Chinggis Khan. And I know that our uh, Mongolian friend will uh, know this quote very well. He said, if one person has a dream, it is but a dream. But if everyone shares in that dream, it will become reality. Ladies and gentlemen, by each and every one of us owning the Korean dream as our own personal dream, let us realize the providential destiny of creating a new nation together as one Korean people. Then let us offer this new nation centered upon the sovereignty of God to the world and fulfill our providential mandate of living for the greater good of all mankind. Can you do this, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> I can't hear you, can you do this, yes or no? Yes. Thank you very much. God bless you and your families.